Welcome to the latest edition of the Google for Business podcast with me, Martin Shervington. Welcome, David Amland, who hey. is the man I go to to find out everything everything these days no it's the, you're the person i come to to check things out to check little ideas out and go what do you think is this too much too crazy too far and you give me a, a very good reality check so you're a mentor of mine david you know that. i'm honored i really am yeah. and we're, we're both in a similar space but in a different space do you want to say what you do and what your latest projects are yeah well um what i do well Primarily, I write books, but in order to write those books, I get access to a lot of data. I advise a couple of um, um, very large companies. I advise a, a number of intermediate companies and also have access to a couple of startups. And um, usually when I work with them, one of the deals which I always make is I have access to data uh, on what they do. Um, and obviously, that gives me a very spherical point of view on how things work, what works, what doesn't work, and why. And I sort of join all those dots. So um, that comes through in my books and it comes through in the advice I give. Let's talk about one of the books as we move forward. The Social Mind, when did that come out? Um, came out in 2012, um, which is uh, 2011. It's the end of the 2011, I yeah. think. Um, and, and basically, uh, social networks were beginning. We, we'd seen the Arab Spring come up. Social networks were beginning to uh, play a very central role. And the question was... Is this going to change things, or is this just a fad which is going to go away? Yeah. And this is largely Twitter at that point, wasn't it, as a global network where people were just organizing themselves and talking about the Arab yeah. Spring. Yeah, I mean, we had, we had two, three things happening at the same time. We had Twitter, we had Facebook, and the Arab Spring primarily sprung around Facebook because of the oh, okay. relatively, relatively, um, relative ease of access that um, um, those... Um, uh, um, countries had to it mm. and then we had private messaging and private messaging happened through um, Twitter um, Facebook because you had that access on the network um, and there were a couple of apps and there was also the BlackBerry um, private yeah. messaging service and that in particular played a central role um, in the in um, the summer of 2010 in Britain when we had all those riots and um, that was also one of the things that featured in in the book yeah, and it's just it, it's people being able to connect, and well, as I say, yeah, use the word organise. But also, what what you've done in the last three years is you've understood culture. I mean, from the conversations that we've had, and that's a part of it. It's not just about the platforms. It's not just about the people. There's a culture. Now, you and I met through Google Plus, and we've said this before. We wouldn't have met probably if it hadn't have been for Google Plus. Yeah, and, absolutely. But a lot of people won't realise that this is the social media side stuff. It is a movement in its own right, and people are coming to these networks. They are connecting. They are finding that the, the people they're passionate about. But what's it all about? What's what's underlying what's going on? I mean, we're talking almost a slightly philosophical level. Mm. Well, I think the the thing we always need we need to understand what guides people. Um, and we have motivations for the things which, which, which we do. And we also crave information. And if we look historically at any kind of um, part of our history or culture or any segment of it, we've always craved that kind of information. Um, you know, even as far as medieval times goes, you know, people traveling from one place to another were essentially the points through which information traveled and news traveled and they, they, were, they were highly prized for that. Um, because of that, um, when the moment we get into any kind of social media environment, we connect and exchange information primarily because we're trying to understand how everything works, where our place in the world is, if you like. And then the obvious question, how can we gain from it in some way, mm. whether it's knowledge, whether it's uh, commercial gain, whether it's reputational value or perhaps even making a new friend. So these are the things which drives us. And the moment we get into an environment which is um, – fairly free in terms of restrictions and boundaries, um, we tend to sort of self-organize almost in terms of those motivations. We find the people who perhaps appeal to us, we create cliques and groups and organizations in the loose sense of the word. Yeah. 
and, and that has its own momentum. In terms of business, I mean, what have you seen over the last three, four years? Because you're really, you were known until most recently because of your book, Trust, which I'm sure we'll come on to, as the semantic search guy and Google semantic search because of that book that you wrote after uh, The Social Mind. So social and search, how do they well, relate for you now? Well, they're, they're all linked, essentially, because the moment we get on the digital um, environment, we need to remember that in a digital space, we've actually made a choice to be there. Uh, unlike the, the physical one where we don't have a choice and we actually need to exist and because we exist, we create an impact and a network of friends and some kind of um, loose community around us. In the digital space, everything is driven by our own intent and by our own, and by our own motivation. In terms of that, the information flow is critical. Uh, it's critical within a social media network because it allows us to actually form a clear idea of what's happening. And it's critical within search. And this is where the two are related. Um, the moment we have access to search, we know things. The moment we have access to social media network, we we'll link those things and basically we we'll begin to gain value in the exchange which we create. So going from one to the other and, and, and back and forth, basically, um, what unites us, what is the coin of the land, is the value of information which we have access to and then the value of the interpretation of that information which we bring to the table. And that's what connects those two. So you can say you're only as good as the information you have access to, yeah. but really you're only as good as the information you can understand and then relate. What about for businesses? No. Okay, this is a good question now because essentially anything which happens in a communal environment and essentially the digital sphere, the social media networks is exactly that. Uh, so anything that happens in a communal environment inevitably has an impact in a commercial sense. So if we see what's happened in terms of what businesses face, this is what used to happen. Their customers used to be compartmentalized, which meant that essentially the experience that a customer had with a company was pretty much um, siloed. Whether it was good or bad, it stayed in that silo. It didn't affect um, any other kind of um, relation exchange the company would have with other customers and didn't really impact on the reputation value of the company. How did we, uh, how did we trust those companies? How did we evaluate who they were? Well, we did through two things. First of all, they told us, trust us because of who we are. And the bigger they were, the more we tended to trust them because they were ubiquitous and big and we thought they wouldn't really want to sour the kind of um, presence which they had. The other thing which we used to use was the um, the cost of their presence. And what I mean by that, well, if they had uh, a very expensive presence, perhaps in magazines, perhaps in newspapers, perhaps in advertising, and they spent a lot of money, the feeling was that they were serious about what they were doing and we had to trust them. Fast forward to the present, and what do we know? We know that essentially these are processes which companies put in place, and those processes do not necessarily reflect their values and their commitment to us. And that's the huge challenge which every business faces today. And they're, they're, historically, they're almost trying to buy trust. Yes. And, and now people, people's voice can be heard, whether it be the reviews and the ratings or whether it's sending a tweet and, and, and everyone being able to see that. So, I mean, you've just written the book Trust. And we're timed around, you know, the, the scandal with VW. Oh. And we were talking just before the podcast started about transparency. And again, this is all, I think that one of the things that we've seen, I think sometimes we take for, for granted, is that the space that we operate, operate in, in social, is a transparent environment. And I think there's a huge step that businesses need to take psychologically. It's like, actually, you can't be half foot in, half foot out, or it's hard to be. It is really a commitment to say, we're going to change how the business is. We're going to change the, the culture of the business. We're going to change how we do business. Okay, I think that, you know, that you just made some really important points here. And let's take the VW example um, as a case study. Essentially what they did here was criminal in many ways. Let's look at the different elements. They lied to the public, they lied to the government, they stole essentially money from the US taxpayer by getting subsidies for things which were supposed to have done in terms of research and environmental impact and they hadn't because they cheated. They became market leaders without being worth it and then they essentially broke the social trust that we have towards that kind of organization. But this is the other thing that happened. Um, the, what made it possible in the first place to act and behave like that was a culture of governance 
and a climate of internal control that is opaque and um, certainly um, not governed by the values which they were projecting. And this is exactly the kind of situation where a business that pretends uh, to be something which is not, which it isn't, eventually is going to get tripped up, mm. either by the behavior to the public or by the behavior internally, which leads to actions and results which contradict what they say they are. And this is what's happened with VW. So now they need to go back to the drawing board, change internally, show us how they have changed internally, make the promise to us of how they're going to rectify what they did, and then show us transparently every step of the way how they keep that promise and how we can hold them accountable. If they fail to do that, their company is 78 years old now and they're going to disappear. So this is a challenge they face. And this is a challenge that every business faces essentially. If you're in a social media environment and how can you not be because your customers are there, you can't lie, you can't pretend. You can't say, hey, you know, we're cool and we believe in what you believe in if you don't actually believe in that internally. So you need to restructure yourself and actually project the right values. And that's a big step for a lot of people. But it's also, the point you're making about, is it a fad? You know, going back a few years, it's like, it's not a fad. It's a change in how we're doing things on this planet. It's a change in how people are connected. It's a change in how people have access to be able to leave a review, for instance, you know, across many different sites and give their opinion. And then it's down to the business to engage. And, and to be part of that conversation as opposed to just letting it happen. But it do, I think it requires it's a different perspective. And I know that I, my mind has changed over the last few years because you're part of a network. And, and you say about the transparency, and you build trust by being transparent, by doing good work and by you know, producing the results. But that requires a, a change in you. And it's like you know all of these people in the businesses, if they're going to be part of... of that space they need to change as well so i think there's a huge development journey or developmental journey for people it is and and this is a ch challenge for businesses um, a lot of businesses don't really understand what they have to do they think that the social media sphere is simply another uh, cheap one-to-many uh, channel of communication where they can just you know push out their message and the moment they do that the inconsistencies begin to incrementally build up um, and that's why you get why you get so many social media crises developing, because people react to that message. The business overreacts to the reaction, and suddenly you see them for what they are. You see them that they're not empathetic. You see that they don't really believe in what they do. They don't trust their audience. They don't really believe in the values that they say they believe in. And suddenly you question, you know, why should I do business with you if you're that kind of business? Yeah. At the end of the day, people like doing business with people. We ask businesses to become more human and humanize themselves. And the moment they fail to do that, we simply withdraw a custom and they face, I mean, across the board, they're facing two things. They're facing higher acquisitions, acquisition costs per customer and a shrinking customer base. And for many businesses, this is catastrophic. Let's move on to Google. Okay. What do you think about what Google are doing at the moment? Well, <clears throat> Google have, and, and they're morphing as a company, let's not forget they're going to Google Alphabet now, they're um, an umbrella organization, they're covering many, many things. But essentially they're still the same thing, they're all about data and information. And what do we mean by that? Well, information essentially and data are not always the same thing. Um, data, we can say it's information which is crude information or raw information, and information itself is beginning to become, to become a bit more refined. But essentially by taking all that, um, they create layers of abstraction, which allow us to see more and more of the world. So they're joining the dots, and they've always been doing that since you know, day one. They're doing it in search, they're doing it on their products, they're doing it in the field of robotics, which are, um, they're uh, beginning to be active in now. They're doing it in, in machine learning, which is a weak form of AI. Um, all these things run on the same thing. They run on data, they run on information, they run on the ability to join all the dots and actually understand what is happening happening around us. And the ecosystem, the Google ecosystem, is vast. So if, you, if you're if talking to business owners and people listen to this now, where do you think they should start to understand? Or, or do, well, let me keep it open like that. What do you think they should be paying attention to? Well, you know, we always start with the basics. You know, if you are in business, what do you need? I mean, what, what does a successful business need? It needs two things. It needs market share and it needs loyal customers. If you have market share, 
you actually have customers. If you have loyal customers, it means you're not constantly fighting to find new customers, which means your customer acquisition costs are not draining your bottom line. How do you achieve that? How do you achieve market share and how do you achieve um, loyal customers? By being you, by being transparent, by being trust trustworthy, by allowing people to connect with you for the values which overlap with their own. So they identify with your business and they feel happy doing business with you. How do you achieve that, these basics? Well, you achieve it through transparency in the information you have in search primarily, in the information you have through social media networks, in the information you have on your website and your advertising literature. So basically you're beginning to create a culture of trust within your organization and then you work really hard to project that outside. And that leads us into SEO Help, which is another book that you've done. You, yes. you, you, the pair of us work hard, don't we? Uh, and this gives guidelines to do exactly that, doesn't it? Ooh. And it's got list guidelines and instructions, really, on how to do that. And, and part of it is it, there's a mentality shift, but there's some practical things that people have to do as well. So let's jump to SEO. Okay. Um, the, actually, SEO Help itself, um, it took about... 12 months to actually bring together and it came from direct access to the SEO teams of the companies I worked with and the questions they raised and they were facing the same issues and the, th the funny thing about the 21st century is that you have a conglomerate which is perhaps active in 11 countries and it has 20,000 plus staff and then you have you know a relatively small business with 15 people working relatively locally and they face the same problems suddenly. Mm -hmm. So it's just a question of scale, and scale itself also introduces problems. So by taking those questions and sort of modifying them a little bit, I created a 20-step blueprint. And if you follow it throughout the book, and every, every chapter has 10 questions, so by the time you get to chapter 20, you have answered in detail 200 questions about your business. Well, if you do that, I mean, even if you manage to get through five chapters and answer 50 questions, you begin to see a shift, an incremental shift in the way you do business, in the way your business is perceived, and then in the impact your business has in terms of your clients and customers. It's interesting, isn't it? If 15 years, well, let's say 12 years ago, if you're writing the book SEO Help, it would have involved keywords and yes. links and the page density of text and all of that. And yet you look at it now and the starting point is you've got to change your business. You've got to change yeah. how you're doing business. And you're talking about terms of transparency in terms of trust. It's a very different world. And yet, there's a lot of businesses that won't realize that this is where it's moved to. Yes. I mean, I'm glad you brought this up because essentially, in business, we tend to, to be fairly blinkered, especially if we're very good at what we're doing, because we tend to focus on the things which we know what to do and incrementally improve them. And we lose sight of what's happening around us. And the first warning signal is when our customer acquisition costs rise, when our loyal customers walk away and we think, you know, what's wrong with them? We're still delivering what we have always promised. But what's happened is you have failed to communicate that or perhaps they don't realize what you're doing because you're focused on what you're doing and you're not telling them. So they can't see inside your organization. And you're quite right. 12 years ago, 10 years ago, SEO was a very technical thing. You got somebody in, they did it for a while, they went away, you improved in search. When you failed again, you know, you called somebody in and they did it again. And now you can't really talk about search without talking about branding, without talking about business identity, without talking about corporate values and business values and individual values and how you actually connect. So we're talking hearts and minds now. It's a very human thing. And, it's, and it has an impact on search, of all things. It has an impact on marketing. It has an impact on people's ability to do business with you. Let's talk specifically about video. You and I appreciate, we like going on camera and we like interviewing and being interviewed and all this sort of thing. I mean, do you think that that is, it's a loaded question because I know you do, but you know, what is the role of video for businesses? I was going to say, you know, do you think the video is important? But you know, how can people use the technology that we've got to, to, to improve well, transparency, to improve their brand perception? Well, video is important because the web is becoming increasingly visual. Um, it is a semantically dense environment because you are. What does that mean? Let's just. Let, well, did you like that? I mean, there was a pun there. Sorry. Yeah. It wasn't it means intended. That, uh, that we communicate um, at several different levels. 65% uh, 60, of communication is nonverbal. So when we're trying to say to somebody, trust me, because I can show you that I'm trustworthy, 
on a website, through text, on social media, through communications, it takes a long time and a lot of effort to actually get there. And video is probably the only viable shortcut that you have on the web because somebody can see what you look like, what you sound like, what your expressions are, what your inflections are. They can see if they like you. They can see if you're like them. These are the points of overlapping contact, um, which in an immediate sense allow us to sort of form a kind of loose relationship with somebody we have never met before. So these are important. This is an important tool in terms of marketing. It's an important tool in terms of showing transparency. It's also a very important tool in terms of you know, um, creating that human connection. And if we take our case as an example, you know, as an author, I used to be very remote. My books did all the talking for me. Um, you know, I didn't really have a lot of contact with my audience. And ever since Google Plus primarily, you know, video became a bigger thing on the web. Um, I've done a lot of interviews, I've done a lot of talking, and as a result, I'm a lot nearer to my direct audience now. Yeah. I actually know what they think, I'm actually immediately accountable for my writing to them. They ask questions, they ask me why I said something, why I included something, why I did not give a lot of attention to something else. It changes my entire mindset. Does it, and it's, it's network thinking, really, isn't it? Is that you are shaped by the network that you're in. So the people that you spend your time with determine the experience you have and also access to the information, the reinforcement of, of, of your ideas. And so it's a very different view for a writer and for, for, for anybody that's blogging. Actually, you got the potential yeah, it is, for that. It, is. it, it isn't but, always just books or only books. Yeah, it, it changes how the sense of perceived value as well. Because it used to be that you know, in creating a book, I had to convince an editor that what I had in, in place as a proposition actually had value for the reader. And it, it, to do that, I had to have an idealized form of the reader in mind, yeah. thinking that you know, this is what's of value to them. And now I actually know what is of value to my audience directly because they've told me. And what I'm creating is, is a direct impact to their business lives. So the, the, the proposition is a lot tighter, a lot more realistic, and the books themselves have actually improved in, in effect because of that. What advice would you give to people about getting started on all of this? Because there's a lot to do. It is, and everybody gets overwhelmed. I mean, the moment they look at it, they think, okay, where can I go from here? And essentially, we need to ask why. Why would you do this? The only reason you would do it is because you want to basically show to your own public who you are and what you do. You basically want to humanize your business. And also, you want to find out who they are. You want to make that connection. So the easiest thing is, is to say, you know, get online and be yourself. And by that, it means it's, it doesn't mean, you know, um, be so transparent you begin to overshare. But it does mean that work to show what are your passions, what are your concerns, what drives you, what are your weak points, you know, what are you concerned about beyond just making a sale and making a business. Um, and these are the human touch points that allow a connection to be made in the first place. And the moment you start making connections, you start building relationships. The moment you start building relationships, you have a viable long-term business. Wonderful. David Amland, where can everyone find you? I am on Google Plus and Twitter, and you can find me on my own website, davidamorland.com. And you know, these are the places I am most easily accessible to, um, at. And just to give a shout out, the name of your latest book, and where can everyone get that as well? Yeah, it's called um, The Tribe That uh, Discovered Trust. It's all about trust and how it is created, developed, lost, and can be regained. You can find it on Amazon or any good bookshop. And it's also available on Google Play uh, in this, as a as download and um, any other ebook store across the world. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David Ameland. Thank you. That, my Googly lovers, was the Google for Business podcast. I'm Martin Shumanton, and I look forward to you listening in next time. Until then. <laughs>